When I told family members I'm studying Zen, a huge red flag goes up in the religious community saying that's Buddhism, that's praying to another God. Zen is absolutely not a religion. What is true Zen? There's so many definitions for what it might be. The idea that Zen equates to calm, as long as there's a kind of positive association with it. But what Zen really means is Walk me through your first moment of discovery. And I was a very sort of angry, rebellious kid, kind of difficult, but thrown out of school. And then when I was 19, I was on a beach and I was just studying a sunset. It was very beautiful. And then suddenly, what century is this? I don't have to be who I think I am. It was mind-blowingly beautiful. It felt like belonging to the whole universe. It's hard to describe, but I became Henry, it is so great to have you on the show. Kevin, thank you very much indeed for having me here. It's great to be with you. I have so many questions for you today. A lot around Zen, living, death, life, like we're gonna get into a lot of it. Um, I wanna start though with one thing that for me has always been, it, it's, it's been this, this problem I have when I talk to Zen with other people where they see Zen, especially in America, as something that is on almost every piece of commercial packaging. Like this will create Zen in you, or this is like, you know, drink this, this, this energy relaxing drink. You're going to have a, like a, a Zen moment or something, right? Like, why do you think that is? Like, it's such a confusing thing because I would love for you to, to think about why that's been co-opted in a way, or what is it about Zen? And then actually what is true Zen so that we can tell the difference because yeah. There's so many definitions for what it might be. Yeah, 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 I know. And the, that phrase, Zen and the art of, yes. has been used e just on every book. So yeah, many that's right. Zen and the art of, of diaper changing, yes. literally. <laughs> <laughs> and look, first of all, I mean, it's a three letter word that is kind of beautiful. Zen, you know, Z-E-N. It's just, mm. it's extraordinary to have a word like that, that's so beautiful, so short, and can convey a lot. And it's been, it entered the, the culture of America and the West in the 50s, basically, and 60s. Yeah. And it became this uh, emblem of a whole worldview, like the, that famous book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Yes. You know? Fantastic the, the, book. It's I, an I incredible it. book. Yeah. And it's still current, you know, 50 years on or whatever it is. But it's, it said so much. It wasn't just kind of a technique. It was a whole view of life and the world that could get encapsul encapsulated in three letters, mm -hmm. just like that, and just had tremendous sort of countercultural power. And then mainstream, sort of a, a way of distilling philosophy and approach to life mm -hmm. into just three letters. I think that's part of its power and why it has been co-opted yeah. in a lot of marketing and stuff. Personally, I don't mind, because actually the idea that Zen equates to calm or something like that. Yeah, peacefulness, relaxation, peacefulness. a moment of Zen, you know. Yeah, that's fine. If that's a little gateway to the, the deeper meaning of the word and what it also connotes, just to have as long as there's a kind of positive association with it, I think it's a good thing, yeah. basically. And so, but what, what it, I mean, you can, you can approach it in many ways, but what Zen really means, you know, what it really connotes is a deep path of existential training. Mm -hmm. By existential training, I mean, a way of coming to experience life in a different way. That if you do, it's a training. You know, and of course, for each of us, how it will sort of train us is a little bit different, but it's a path that medium to long term of coming to experience life in a very different way that's so much richer and so much wider, where in any moment you can come back to here and now, and you're right here and now, and also aware of something bigger. Mm -hmm. It's as if this little tiny word can open up a much wider sense of an ordinary moment. When you say training, um, take me back to, through the, the lineage of this. So it was, mm -hmm. 
Chang in China. Mm -hmm. And then it, that, when it made its way over to Japan, changed the word change to Zen to be the Japanese version of that word. That's right. What was the training? Because when I think of like people talk about, I've heard people say, hey, I do headspace. I, I practice Zen. Like, you know, it's because it's, they think of Zen as just relaxation, yeah. you know? And so yeah. what is the training of Zen? Like at, at its core, is it, yeah. is it just meditation? Is it a yeah. specific, different flavor of meditation that sets itself apart from everything else? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you can, again, it's going to be a little bit of a multivalent answer because mm -hmm. it can mean several kinds of training. One of which is just de-stressing. Zen has always said from the early Chan days, actually, that there are different kinds of Chan or Zen, meaning some people want it for just calming down, mm. for regulating the nervous system. Uh, some people want it for being, you know, more effective at work. You can actually get more concentration, more power of, of focus, getting into flow states more easily with work, you know. It can be very yeah. good on that front. But there's the, the deeper side of it that goes beyond those is this real sort of study of who am I? Mm. What, what is this experience I'm having right now? Because we take so much for granted, you know, this is my body, I'm somewhere in the body, I'm a, I'm a me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a nugget or core identity that I have that's sort of in this body for a given number of decades, yeah. I hope, you know, and then it's over or whatever our belief system might be. But actually, that formulation can be interrogated, can be studied. So the deeper path of Zen is studying essentially what's going on here. You know, there's consciousness, there's the human mind, human body, human heart with its feelings. But what actually is this experience? And, you know, it's, it's a little subtle and maybe not so easy to get one's head around it because basically it's saying we take for granted that experience is arising. There's consciousness and there's experience. But how come it's arising? What actually is it? We get so sort of locked onto what yeah. we're experiencing and managing all of that, that to take the, the step back, say, well, hold on, what is it to be experiencing at all? Are you yeah. talking about contemplation of life and death? That comes into it because we, we can, we can. Like, why does life exist? Why was I, why, why was I gifted into this universe? Exactly. And, and along with that, what actually is it to be alive? You know, to be having conscious experience is, is actually something that if you get sort of quiet enough through the practice of meditation, mm. you can study, you know, what, what is going on in any ordinary moment. And the more we study it, the more we, we, we rest in it mm. and can sort of look at it, we find there's, there's something here that we'd overlooked. Be before we go into that, when you say the word study, that's a little bit of a loaded term. Because yeah. I think academically, uh -huh. people often think of like, well, there's a book I should read. And if you're a Christian, you study the Bible. If you're a Mormon, it's the Book of Mormon, like the Quran. There's many, many religious texts. Yeah. What is that for Zen? Oh, yeah, it's totally different. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. What we're studying is experience. But is there any books? Is there any books that like are considered the the kind of like you know the the corpus of data that are information that i need to know how to practice in or is it oh, yeah. is it is it how is this handed <laughs> yeah. down yes, you know yes, very, very like, how question. do i know that you're yeah. practicing zen versus what they were practicing in china yeah you know, oh so long ago yeah you know? okay that's a great question there isn't an equivalent in terms of it's laid out here just read it and you'll understand it and then you'll get it no there isn't that but there are uh, what Zen has a real special thing it has is, is, a, is these uh, things called koans. And koans are little phrases that are apparently paradoxical. They don't make a lot of sense. Like, what is the sound of one hand is a famous one. Yeah. You know, you know the sound of two hands clapping, but do you know the sound of one hand? And so that is an actual Zen koan. Yes. It's which, is, which is, how, when, when, when did that originate? When yeah, did that they, actually... They, yeah, they, the, the, mostly the koans originated in China in the time of Chan, which was 
Uh, there Hundreds was this, of years ago? What are we I talking mean, about the here? More, more, thousands. Okay. I mean, there was this great period of Zen's first great sort of flourishing was Tang Dynasty China, which is 600 to 608 to 918 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Maybe I got that slightly wrong, but 600s to 900s in China. So 1400 to 1100 years ago, basically. So during that time, uh, essentially, by the way, Zen is a form of Buddhism. Right. I was going to say, what made the link there? So yeah. was there a link from India? Yeah, into... there totally is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the, there was a form of there was a form of Buddhism in India. This is according to Zen, called mm -hmm. Jhana Buddhism or mm -hmm. Jhana Buddhism, which is a kind of it is actually a, a bona fide thing, Jhana practice, where you're developing your power of essentially developing flow states in meditation. So that, according to Zen, is what sort of was brought from India to China. When it was in China, in that, and it was really flourishing, that, that process happened over 500 years. Who is the master in China that was considered to be the one that, that adopted it in China first? Well, well, according to sort of legend, or possibly some history, there was a figure called Bodhidharma, yeah. who came in the uh, 6th century from India to China, was said to have lived to the age of 150. And, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat legendary, no doubt. But there probably was an actual master called Bodhidharma who came, who did practice this deep meditation Buddhism, as opposed to other kinds of Buddhism with other practices, like, you know, more sort of veneration or worship or sacrifice or whatever, other kinds of... Maybe Were there other going on at the same time? Was, was this in the age of Confucius or before Confucius? I think it's after that. After that. Taoism was... Da Taoism was already in, okay. well established in China. And so it infused the form that Buddhism took in, in China. The Taoism did. Mm -hmm. But the koan thing arose in that early period of, of Zen, 600 to 900. Okay. And what they, essentially what happened is that masters or practitioners... Who, who, have, who have gone through the training and something's happened to them. And they're living in a, in a slightly different state of mind from most of us. They would say things and do things that apparently didn't make sense. But actually, if you could sort of get to their frame of mind, they did make sense. Hmm. So the koan became a kind of entry point that you, know, you, you could sit with this bizarre thing somebody said or sometimes a tiny little narrative of something they did. And you take it into your meditation. And in order for it to start to make sense to you, it, it, it sort of, it can trigger a shift mm. in, your, in your own experience. And then suddenly what seemed like, you know, gibberish, nonsense, gibberish suddenly you, you have, a, you have a, a, minor, a minor or a major epiphany. It's, what, it, what, 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 can, what parallels do you have in, in a non-enlightened person's reality. Because what you're talking about is like you're saying there's an awakening moment where a shift happens in the mind. And that idea of what you said there with, you know, the sound of two hands, what is the sound of one hand? Yeah. All of a sudden, if I had gone through that, yeah. I'd be like, well, I know what that, I, I, I got it. Is that, is that more or less like I would understand it yes. instantly? Yeah, it's like, it is, it is, it is actually like that. It's beautiful. I mean, imagine... You know, an aha moment when we suddenly, yeah. when suddenly we understand something. The only we... thing I can think of is pre and post kids. All <laughs> my friends could tell me what it's like to have yeah. a kid and the yeah. love that you will feel for a child. Yes. And that was just like, I know what love feels like. And it was like, I could understand it from a like 10,000 feet kind of point of view. Yeah. It, but when you have one and you're holding that little being, a chamber opens up in your heart. Yeah that was always there, yes. but is revealed in a new and more compassionate and deeper way that you just can't put into words. That's, that's exactly right. It's is, very is that analogous. Similar? It's very, very similar. Because actually what happens in, in a moment of awakening, if we call it that, is this shift where um, you discover something that had been going on all along anyway that you just hadn't noticed. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it actually, always touches the human heart. Our hearts open. It's, it's very analogous. Is it a laughing type moment? Because like some of the, the um, accounts I've heard of people going into having this shift, yeah. they almost, they, some burst out laughing. Yeah. And I, I can imagine 
in my head, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because obviously I've not had this shift, but it would seem like it would be funny because it was so obvious that it was there all along. Yes, it's like, it's, how did I forget this? Oh, it's you know? how did I forget this? Yes. So it's, it's not a discovering, it's a, you had forgotten it. It feels like that. It feels like you're just rediscovering something that had been here all along that had been long forgotten. So, forgotten in the previous life, forgotten since childhood. I don't know. I would guess since early childhood. Because it's, I remember being a child and having these, this, these moments of just like, just, just ease and just, there was no care. There was no expectations. There was like, it was very present. Yes. I didn't care what was going to happen tomorrow. And I didn't care what happened yes. yesterday. Yes. It was all about yes. like, and yes. I know that's not the same, but is, is there a bit of, am I, am I hitting on something? Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. It's totally on it. There's definitely a strong parallel there. I mean, what, let me see if I can put it another way. You, we're, we're living in a certain way and our, you know, as we grow up, through childhood into adulthood, we get very uh, conditioned to be thinking ahead mm. and looking back to learn from the past and thinking ahead to the future and planning and sort of being on a path, a track, you know. And this would be a sudden moment when all that drops and we, we just enter into this moment very, very vividly. Mm. And so it, it, it's got that in common with childhood presence. Mm. And sometimes it's, it's even wider and sort of deeper. We, we find that the whole of our life had been held by something much greater that we've always been part of, which seems to, you know, feel like it's, it's sometimes it can feel like it's the whole cosmos, you know, is present right here now. And you know, sometimes it's less cosmic and just more like, wow, I'm kind of part of this very room that I'm in. It's like the separation between me and my surroundings drops away and it's uh, the everything's here and joined in one kind of substance and it's a beautiful discovery and it's not a whether it's a discovery or the recovery of something long forgotten in a way it doesn't matter because it hasn't been present to me and when it suddenly is it changes everything it really changes everything it, and is this what's called enlightenment well i don't know whether the word enlightenment or awakening i don't know the, 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 the Western mind put the word enlightenment on it, mm -hmm. but the, the, actually the word enlightenment has different meanings in the West. You know, historically, it's a, a movement of, uh, of political and, sure. and science rebirth and stuff in the 17th, 18th centuries. But this is, so we use that word a lot in the West, I know. The original uh, Sanskrit word bodhi, which uh, the word Buddha comes from as well, is to do with awakening. It's like waking up from a dream and, and waking into a greater reality. You know, mm. it's very beautiful. And, and the thing about it is it's not, um, it's real. That, that's the most important thing. It's not that we're sort of distorting our minds into doing something unusual, you know, or going into some special place or even going into an altered state. I don't think so. It's actually, we've actually been living in a kind of altered state and we're, and which has been a tightening and a constricting of our experience. Mm -hmm. And that releases, relaxes and releases. And then we're, we're actually back in a more real experience, but we just got so conditioned to, to living in a narrower sense mm -hmm. of things. And so we're, we're relaxing into a much broader sense of things. And then when, so coming back to the koan, yeah. When, when we're sitting with the Cohen, it's, it's, we'll use our minds to try to unravel this crazy riddle and we get nowhere. And eventually at some point, the mind just gives up, really gives up. And, and then often it's, a, it's even some despair. Like, oh God, I'll never get this. I'll never get this. I'm giving it up. You know, and two days later, somebody might, having given up like that, suddenly they're, you know, they're in a supermarket aisle reaching for the frozen peas and suddenly they just get hit by this oh, i'm part of everything or you know or every, I, this I, pop I, this change this shift yeah, this, this moment shift happens but, but that will so be can, you say giving up we should go a little bit into cons and how they apply to practice because it says so far we mentioned there's these riddles if someone is going to practice legitimate zen and take up koan study yeah 
when you say back to your example of, uh, and we can introduce Moo if you would, you'd like as well, but you, back to your example of the, the, what is the sound of one hand? Uh-huh. What are, what are you practicing? Like, like, like it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have yeah, this yeah. printed on the piece of paper, okay, send yeah. one hand. Well, okay, now yeah. what do I do? Yeah, you know? yeah. good question. And, good and question. there's a book. Yeah. We should tell the people there is a book of these koans. Oh. 500 plus of them, is there more than that? Like there's, there's several books. Yeah, several, several great books. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like the, the, the Blue Cliff record is one and the Gateless Gate is another. For example, they're, they're from Tang, mostly from actually just after the Tang Dynasty in China. They got collected around a thousand years ago. But um, yeah, good question. What, what, it, what, what really has to happen is that somebody is already meditating. Okay. They already have a regular meditation practice. And that's just following the breath. Is that like classic, like the way we think it, of meditation when we've yeah. taken any handful of apps, it's like, I'm yeah. just, I'm, I'm, I'm my, my, I, the, the goal of what I'm supposed to be doing is to focus on a singular point, follow that breath, and when a thought enters the mind, recognize it, let it go, don't take offense to it, and move back to the focusing on the breath. Is that what you consider to be a basic meditation practice? Yes, but there's, there's others that are also basic. Okay. And broadly speaking, there's two big sort of categories of meditation. One is like that, focus attention on a single given object, for example, the breath. But another whole camp of, of early and, and long-term meditation too, is open awareness. And Zen has that as well, mm-hmm. by the way, not only the koan path. Mm-hmm. Open awareness means you're actually not trying to focus on any one thing. You're trying to be wide open and in, instead just be aware of whatever is uppermost in attention. What's that called? Shikantaza, or just sitting. Okay. Just sitting. But I mean, many other traditions have it, not only Zen, right. where you just say so you're, you're just sort of uh, resting in awareness. And, you know, you might notice the breath, you might notice the sound, you might notice your foot, you might notice your seat, you know, then a thought comes and you're, you're just open to any of it. And you're not trying actually to guide your attention. You're just sort of resting open. They say sort of being like a mirror. Mm-hmm. So that's also a, 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 a foundational and long-term part of practice. So in, if you're sitting with a koan, what would happen? Or if you pick up a koan, you want to... Mm-hmm. S- Try practicing with a con. You're doing either of those kinds of practice. And um, so you got your piece of paper that says, what is the sound of one hand? I have, what, what, what does that even mean? I didn't right. know. So we just try saying it in our minds. What is the sound of one hand? And then we come back to our practice, wh- whichever it may be. And we just sort of feel, did, does saying that phrase in my mind have any effect? Like, is there some, is there anything? That... How, what's the spacing look like there? So if you yeah. said that, yeah. and then you go to feel it, is it a repetitive, almost like a mantra type? Because when I think of mantra-based meditation, a yeah. transcendental meditation, yeah. uh, they'll give you a word and they say, this word is to be repeated over and over and over again. Yeah. And if you're doing a proper 25 minute set, yeah. you probably said it hundreds of times. Yes. How does that differ with koan-based study? Is it yeah. a saying it, reflection period of X number of seconds, and then saying it again? What's, what's... There, are, there are different ways. Okay. So we're getting into the, the, the real weeds here. It's great. So you can do it on every exhale. That's one common method is just repeat the phrase on every exhale. And by the way, you know, what is the sound of one hand is, is not by any means the, uh, the only early one you could ask. Who am I? Who am I? I like that one better. It's probably a better beginner. Would you say this is a better I, I, beginner? I think it is. I yeah. think it is actually. Yeah. Although I've known people sit with, there's a, some surgeon who was doing a, a military surgeon actually was doing some practice uh, loosely with me, who you know came out of the operating theater with he'd been sitting with what is the sound of one hand, and all of a sudden he, he just sort of exploded in a huge experience of awakening. Wow! Through the sound of one hand, so it can happen. You know. Wow. But, but typically, who am I is sort of a bit easier because you can kind of, it's not so obviously nonsensical kind of thing. Um, and, but there are others too, like uh, who hears, who hears. Mm. We just repeat it. So can be on every exhale, you repeat it. Can also be you, you, you say it. This is all in your mind, you know, silently in the mm. mind. You hear it in your mind. Who hears? 
And then you just wait. And then a few seconds later, or you know, 10 or 20 seconds later, you, you repeat it and you see. Or it can be, you, you, you just drop it in and sort of forget about it and do maybe breath practice or maybe just the open awareness practice. And, uh, and maybe it comes back to you in five or 10 minutes. You, you just repeat it again. Mm. But you don't really, you don't have to do the repetitive use of it. Mm -hmm. But that is a, also a common method too. You mentioned Mu, actually. Yeah. So the, there's a koan, one of the sort of common early koans to use. Arguably, this would probably be the most non-commercial famous. Like the sound of one hammer is probably the most commercial famous in terms of yeah. most people have heard of that. Yes. But yes. you would say in terms of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, obviously you're the, you're the experts. Yeah. In terms of beginners getting started, uh -huh. is it typically move the, the go-to? Yes, it usually is commonly, although that would depend a little bit on which lineage and which school. Yeah. But it very often is. But that would only be once somebody has got a, a steady practice. Okay. And has, you know, clearly got a curiosity and mm. feels that this is, I got a, they got a curiosity about examining, you know, the state of experience, what it is. What do they want? When someone, what, what's the common thread you see amongst your students? What curiosity, yeah. what are they looking for? Well, like, I think, can I speak for, for, for yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just be like really transparent and, and vulnerable for a minute. I don't know where I'm going. And my dad has passed away and I miss him severely. And I want to know what happens after death. And I have a fear of death. Like internally, I feel like it's a scary thing. And so is that common for people? Like, is it, do, does, do people come into this? Is that a curiosity that, that is valid to have? Is that a, what are the common curiosities that people approach you with? And what can Zen solve for them? Yeah, that's a beautiful thing to share. Thank you. It's absolutely probably the most common. It's like, well, what, what happened? What, 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 what's going to happen? I mean, I'm in this life and suddenly I'm not going to, you know, I know that's going to happen. And I've lost someone I love. What's, what, how do I process it? What, is, what does it mean? You know, so that's actually what Zen is for. It's, it's really for revelation or gentle sort of exposing us to more dimensions of what life actually is, to getting, it's as if we've had a two-dimensional view and we can have a three-dimensional view. Hmm. Well, I actually think we've got a three-dimensional view, but we can have a four-dimensional view or a five-dimensional hmm. view. We can literally open up to sensing another dimension at least in, in real time in real time like right now like you I mean, feel this right now yeah there's obviously a great space here right now it's not you know we're talking what to each other space. it's a great it's a great i think it's a great space of love and that love holds both life and death mm. and it, and it makes it makes death okay because it shows us that love is bigger than we think it is life is bigger than mm. we think it is. you know then they talk about this, this awakening experience is finding your own original nature or finding your, seeing your own original face. And it's, it's discovering something outside time that's present always. And it's, it's some people say it's, it's awareness itself. Some people say, eh, maybe, but maybe it's space. Some people say, not sure, maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's empty, but all of them are good. It's, it's finding this extra dimension that, that puts our whole life as we know it in a different perspective. And from that different perspective, you know, our hearts are open. They feel suffering readily. And we, don't, we sort of don't mind because hmm. it makes our hearts more open. And our hearts are supposed to feel. They're not supposed to be closed. Of course, they often get that way because we get hurt. We get afraid, we, we, we're afraid of our existential situation. But, but this discovery, and it can come in little glimpses and different times. There's not always one earth-shattering 
revelation. No, it doesn't need to be. It's little hits that soften and open our hearts. And we start to sense, ah, oh, there's something more here mm. now. Not in some future time, but right now. And, and we're being held. It's like being held by a greater reality. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to sense. And some of it we can put into words, and some of it we just can't. Mm. But we know it. But it's kind of a different kind of knowing. It's not the kind of knowing you can get from a words on paper. Right. It's not, not book knowledge. It's, it's not book knowledge. And in a way, it puts all the things we can know through book knowledge in another, in another perspective too. There's this wider sense of belonging and of participating in sort of in the life of the universe is, mm. is really what it feels like, or at least the life of this world. You know, we're, we're, there's something bigger here. And I, I just love it because I've been on the trail of it since I was a, a kid, actually, for various reasons. Walk you know? me through your first moment of discovery. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I was, I, 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 I've taught, I've written about this, you yeah. know, and I, I don't want to, I was lucky. I got lucky in a certain sense. I'd had a, actually rather, rather a difficult childhood with a severe skin affliction and, and, um, you know, and so on, and a difficult parental divorce, very difficult, actually. And, um, and then when I was, uh, when I was very sort of angry, rebellious kid, and kind of difficult, got thrown out of school and, uh, you know, stuff happened. Then when I was 19, um, I, I was, uh, I'd gone away. I grew up in Oxford, England, you know, and I'd actually got an early place to go to Cambridge. Um, but I kind of, didn't want to actually. That that my family was very academic, you know. Yeah. Both my parents were professors. So. It was like you should do this because you are. It's, yeah. It's like I had a, a dad like that too. That was like, this is the path. Follow what I'm doing. You're in trouble if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and you've ca carved your own road. Yeah, right? totally. Yeah. I, I ended up rebelling a lot actually, yeah. Yeah. And, and then not doing certain things that he wanted me to do. But yeah, so please right. continue. So so I went off and actually. I worked in uh, South America and, and for a few months and then traveled, backpacked. Uh, before going to university, I had a big chunk of time off. And, uh, and I wrote my first book, actually, during that time. Uh, I was a, I'd been a young poet, you know. So towards the end of my trip out in uh, South America, I was, uh, I was on a beach uh, all alone, uh, having finished my book, which brought a great sense of uh, accomplishment. You know, I was only 19 and I, mm -hmm. damn it, I've written a book, you know. And, um, and I, was, I was curious about the world, you know, and I was just studying a sunset as it happened, just watching the process of the sun going down over the horizon of the great Pacific, you know. And it was a very beautiful experience, you know, thoroughly all alone, just studying this sunset. And, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, really out of nowhere, I had no interest in the kind of thing we've been talking about. You'd never meditated actually. at this point? No. Actually, I had a little bit as a 14, 15-year-old okay. from reading Be Here Now by Ram Dass. Mm. I just tried it a little bit. But it wasn't part of my life at all. You know, I was, I was basically a, you know, literary. I was interested in poetry, you know. So looking at this scene of the beautiful sunset, Pacific Ocean, sun going down, lovely beach, nobody around at all, all alone. And suddenly, you know, I'm all alone. What century is this? It could have been any century. This young human looking at the sun, looked by the ocean. Nothing, there was actually nothing in the scene to tell me it was 20th century. Was this a thought that hit your head? Like what, saw, what century is this? I, yeah, yeah. I realized. Was it a confusing thought or were you just being like, oh, crazy, this could be any sense? It, it was liberating. It a was like, liberating It thought. was suddenly like, I, I don't have to be who I think I am. That was the first thing. Like, I don't really know. I'm just a human body, male human body, young in the world. And suddenly it was as if the trappings of my life, who I am, you know, my nationality, time and place, sort of fell away. That was the first thing. And then 
freed of who I thought I was, for just a moment, I suddenly uh, joined what I was looking at. It's, it's, the, it's hard to describe, but I became the whole scene. Instead of I'm in here looking out, it was rather I joined, I dropped away in my normal sense of being Henry and became part of a greater whole that was showing up as this scene. What did that feel like to you? It was, it was mind-blowingly beautiful. It felt like belonging to the whole universe. And, and actually, uh, it got deeper because then once I was part of the scene, the fabric of the things in the world, it's as if I just dropped right into the fabric of creation is what it felt like. And I could see... In that you were the creator? No, 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 no. I, I'm the observer. Of, not the observer either. I'm just part, part of, of everything. Part of everything. Fully integrated. Fully integrated. It was like... I, I felt that I, I, was, I was part of the whole universe, that the, the beginning of time was just here, and the end of the cosmos was just here. When you and say just here, you're still doing separation with your hands. Was time well, I'm flattened, trying to, it, or...? It, it, no, it's more like it, it was just one field okay. that had no dimension. It's one sort of, it's really very difficult to How describe. How long did this last for? Not very long. Like 10 seconds? Or? I think it was probably a little longer, but probably less than, I'd say it was very likely less than five minutes. Okay, so you're, <laughs> not, you're not practicing meditation. And I'm were not on just, anything. Were you, just, were you literally like, did someone like laced drug my, me? Yeah, exactly. Laced my coffee. Did you think that? No. I, I, well, I, well, I knew You must that have been I, confused though, right? Like, how can I, you not be confused? It was so beautiful. The beauty was overwhelming. So I just, I just. You just went with it. I went with it. Yeah. That, and there really wasn't anybody left to resist. Huh. And I felt that it was really like, I mean, honestly, it was, if I get into the detail, it was like all there was was this field kind of made of nothing with all these little shifting sparks. And, and that's what I was and it's what the cosmos was. And Could had, you have stood up and walked around at that point or were you, you just fallen over because everything was so... Like, I don't I, know. That's a good question. The, the, the thing yeah. I think about is like, you know, I've, I've had some experience with, with psychedelics for therapy reasons. I did a heroic dose of mushrooms one time after my dad passed and I had to use the bathroom and that you take the mask off and I'm like, I can't even get two feet. <laughs> I will collapse. Like, was it that yeah. disorienting where you were just like, whoa, like, wow, feel like, did it just knock your socks off kind of thing? Did you have to yeah. stay seated for a minute or... I think yeah. I was standing oh, actually, wow. at the time. Okay. But, but honestly, in the thick of it, there could have been no thought about, do I need to walk? Mm -hmm. that, that just wouldn't have come up. I was just, I was gone. And then I remember- Henry was gone. Henry was gone. And, and it was huh. the, the, the separate body, it was all gone. And, and then it sort of, it, it faded to the extent that, oh, I'm standing on this beautiful beach. I, I was back. You were back. Knowing where I was. But when I was back, I had this just overwhelming feeling of love in my heart that was like a physical flame of love. Just, just beautiful, pouring flame of, I mean, it didn't burn, but it was like a flame, just yeah. pouring, pouring for the next... 48 hours or something. And I was, I was, it was just overwhelmingly mm. beautiful. And I'd found, I'd found, I'd found, I hadn't been a seeker at all, but I'd found what seekers see without being a seeker. That doesn't make any sense. Well, people call themselves <laughs> seeker, okay. you know, meaning they're on a spiritual search. Yes. Right? Yes. I had found the answer. You know, and is that found, not to seek? I wasn't looking, but it had showed itself anyway. See what I mean? So I had suddenly found right. what I, years later, I come to realize seekers are looking for. They're looking for this, that they believe rightly that there's some kind of union between me and the universe mm -hmm. that can be found. And they're right. That's what I feel. Right. You're right. It can be found. Okay. Then why I got it without looking for it I don't know, but I know that it was not the end of the road for me because after that, so I had this, you know, yeah, awakening experience. Everything 
the whole, everything was different thereafter. Because I, I, I found what my, what my real life really was. I believe it was uh, Master Dogen that said, body and mind drop, o- drop away. Yeah, yeah. Was it Dogen? It, he, he did say that, yeah. It, was that what you experienced? Or I, was it I, not to that level? I, like, I suspect it wasn't to that level. Can, can we talk about the, the gradients of awakening? Because like so yeah. many people think, and this is like, I, I'm just drawing from personal experience from friends' conversations, they think that awakening is a switch. Yeah. And it's like, if you're awakened, it's switched on and you're yeah. awakened and you are now a perfect human. Yes. I would differ. I would Yeah, differ. I know. That's, I'm, I'm really curious because yeah. like, you but know. I, I think it, I, that it may be the, I mean, I could say that, okay, for me, I, you know, for a few weeks, I was in a blessed, transfigured state. But then I went home. And in that very open state, all the unhappiness in my childhood just overwhelmed me. I was re-traumatized and I went through a really hellish time for a few years. Then I got on the path. I actually then got on the path of training, of doing the therapy and a lot of meditation. And so I've come to understand that for, anyway, for me, it's a path of healing and awakening. Mm. And it's true that, God, 20, 25 odd years later, after a lot of training, I did actually go through uh, various other, you know, revelatory moments, kind of like that, but different. And then eventually something else happened that was sort of, I think it was deeper, actually, when really there was just nothing and in the most beautiful way and, and different from that, that early experience. And, and then I kind of, that really did seem to make a decisive shift, actually. But I, but I would still wouldn't say, I mean, I don't, I, I now have a very, you know, sort of whole kind of view of the whole thing. And I, I don't even, I love Henry. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have a feeling I've got to get rid of Henry. You know, it's like, I mean, I and don't. Henry is flawed. Henry's deeply flawed. Even to this yeah. day. Yeah. It, I, you can still get in arguments with your wife. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> I can be difficult, you know. Yeah. And, and I, I hope I kind of catch it sooner. Yeah. You know, and I, I certainly, because when I catch it, I can get free of it sooner. That's for sure. That's always been this thing where it's like, there's, there's this perception that it, it, someone that is awakened or enlightened or has this moment is, is now operating from a plane that gives them kind of carte blanche to do whatever they want to be this, yeah. you know, guru. I know. And it really screws with people because yeah. they follow these individuals. I think of um, Wild Wild West, the documentary about uh, Ojo, right? Yeah. You read his stuff yeah. and you're like, there's some valuable, awesome yeah. teachings here. For sure. And then you look at that documentary and you're like, my yeah. God, the guy had like yeah. guns and like was manipulating women and like all these horrible things. Yeah. How do you come to terms with that? Is it that we can have these uh, moments of awakening a guru can? and have insights, but then use them for evil? Yeah. Is that a possibility? It totally is. I mean, it, there's the, actually, I mean, uh, if I can use the language, there's the technical term, the enlightened asshole. Oh, is it, <laughs> that can happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, okay, what I'd say, Kevin, is um, we need uh, checks and balances, mm-hmm. you know? And so when it comes to, I mean, for example, actually, why teach, you know, just because, You've, you've, you may have been through a, a wonderful shift, and, but maybe you share it just in the way you live and in your generosity and your compassion. I, I, I used to go to prisons and, and share meditation or just being with, with inmates. I did a fair bit of hospice work and being with people who were dying because it was very easy to be with people who were dying from that state because you already know that you've seen that Life is this beautiful thing, but in a way, it's, uh, it's not as solid as we think it is, you know? So it's kind of okay. I mean, even after that first experience I had, I could have died that night as a 19 year old and knowing my life had been completely fulfilled. That's what it gave me for, what do, for a bit. What do you tell someone that's in hospice that's laying there and says, Henry, where am I going? Yeah, or I don't want to die. Or I don't want to I've die. I've been with somebody who was dying very young, uh, who was a friend, actually. But I just sat with her. And 
and, and this was in her last days when she still, you know, she didn't want to, she didn't want to go. But um, sitting together, when she's in that very still state in the last days, not really drinking even, you know, just a little sponge swab on the, on the lips, and um, very still. And actually in that stillness, there was, we could sort of meet, uh, maybe this sounds a bit woo-woo, but when I was meditating with her, which, you know, I said, uh, let's meditate, you know, and I, for several days. Was she a practitioner as well? Or? Not really, but okay. kind of wanted to try that. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, you could feel at moments, well, I, I think I, I could feel that some part of her met with something that I was feeling and we sort of joined in it and there was peace. And so there wasn't really peace through words, but there was, I think, moments of peace through no one. Mm. And just being in stillness together. Because, I mean, you know, in the end, when it gets really near the end, there's a, there's a, there's a great release mm. that happens. And it can, be, it can be very beautiful, even when somebody, you know, we all think this is the wrong time. This shouldn't be happening now. But even then, there can be this surrender, you know, and, and that surrender is always beautiful. It's freeing, right? It's freeing. Because you're not carrying the burden anymore. You're like, I've, I'm, I'm surrendered. Exactly. And th that's what I think every awakening experience, certainly that I've ever had, and, uh, and especially that bigger one that I'm just briefly referenced that came later, it was a, it was a great surrender. And when Dogen talked about body and mind, fall away that's sort of what it means it's a it's a it's a kind of total surrender where everything that we think we are and that we understand the world to be we just let it go yeah and we don't know how that happens because we actually can't make it happen but it can happen and then we're, and then we're kind of freed yeah I and mean, that, that's the beautiful thing then what are we freed for well we're free to feel our hearts open is the main thing i mean that's why you know, the, the, my new book actually coming out in July is called Original Love, because I've taken that phrase, original nature mm -hmm. in Zen, or original face. They talk about see your original face. And actually, why see it? Because of the love it opens up. Mm -hmm. So I call it original love, which I think is actually an accurate word. But wait, coming back to the, the, the gurus and stuff. Yes. You know, so why not just experience it and not teach? I mean, I only yeah. started teaching for one reason. My teachers told me to. And they, uh, you know, in, in, and they are, they themselves were told by their teachers, you know. So it was part of a, you know, a lineage. How and, do they vet you? How do they say, yeah. Henry, you are now sanctioned to teach Zen? Because this is coming from Japan, right? This is, is like, yeah. Yeah. what was that process like? Like, how yeah. can they say, okay, this is a good one? We want to deputize you to be a teacher. Yeah. How do they confirm? Is it via your understanding of koan? <laughs> is Actually, that... it is largely that. But I would say also, Kevin, they do it gradually. Like in our lineage, first you're, you know, fairly junior assistant teacher, then you're a full teacher, and then you're an associate master, and then you're authentic master. And it's step by step. And those steps might take two decades to go through or yeah. something like that. And um, so what, but the, yes, the, for each kind of grade or whatever of, of responsibility, which is what it is really, you, it's about you know, meeting with, a, with the master, who's the abbot of the whole lineage, with a koan. How, how you know, he can vibe, how clear you are on this koan. And if you're clear on it, it means, if you're clear on the koan, in some way you're clear, but you can get clearer and clearer. There's more and more that can fall away. What do they call that? The the, the clearing of the eye or something like yeah, that? Yeah, they do actually. Yeah. So so um, you basically have this keeper of knowledge. Like these 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 Zen masters have a full complete understanding and a um, what do you call it when someone has been a transmission of this knowledge, and they will sit down with you, and they will do checking terms. Mm -hmm to try and check your knowledge. Yes. And yes. it's almost like a, 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 what do they call it? Like a, a Dharma combat or something like it that? It can be, it can yeah, be. So yeah, so do they throw stuff at you? Yes. You have to 
you have to quickly respond back, like with whatever you're feeling? Well, you respond without thinking, you know. And so I wouldn't call it a knowledge. It's right. more like an openness. It's how open are you? Mm. So the master asks some, some question, you know, and, and if you're still holding somewhere, you think, oh, what did I say to that? And then it's over. You didn't pass. You didn't pass. Because this isn't going to come out of it, thought. And they, if someone was listening, and I know these are private kind of closed uh, yeah. interview sessions you have, yeah. if there happened to be someone in that room when this checking is going on, yeah. Would they just be like, what the hell are you guys talking about? Like, they might. Really? They might. Really? Because like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, if, if because the... what you think is, you know, the thing I was talking about, there's great, there's something greater. So if you are not plugged into that, right. the questions will come in and they won't make sense. And right. You think, oh, well, I could try this, you know. But no, but if you're plugged into it. Because you don't speak that language. You don't, you, you aren't exactly. tapped in. It's, it's like, I think it's really like the movie, uh, what's it called? Arrival. Do you remember those, the, the, the heptopods? Yes. You know that movie? Yes. You know, they speak that language yes. in ink, like Zen circles, right. like Zen ink circles, kind of. They're speaking a language that she can't understand it until she's been changed, mm. until her view I gotta of time. i got to go watch that again. That was a good a, movie. It's like a koan training. You're learning a language, but you can't learn this language until your whole mind and heart wow. have gone through a revolution. So the, actually learning the language isn't learning a language on the level that you understand reality. Right. You have to have a different sense of reality to get the language. Understood. That's what it's like. It's a unique language, can actually. You, can you give me an example? Are you allowed to share like the, the sound of one, one hand? Could you give me what a checking question would sound like? Or would that be... Well, I mean, the, the questions would be something like, how big is the sound of one hand? That would be a, a question you would ask. Check, yeah. How big is the sound of one hand? Yeah. Show me the sound of one hand. Oh my God. Um, okay. How okay. old is the sound of one hand? You know, the, the question is like that. So, and so I have no answers to that. No. But you're saying but you if could. I had that shift, I'd be like, well, this. Yeah. And yes. you'd be like, okay, next yes. question. Yes. How many coins did you have to pass to become a full accredited Zen master? Well, it's not, you know, honestly, I've been through... There's about, uh, I think accurately, there's something like 460 koans in our, in our lineages sort of curriculum. Which is Sanbo Zen. Sanbo Zen. And um, I've been through it um, under, you know, supervision or with, with a master, um, kind of two and a half times, twice with... Uh, of all of them? All of them. All wow. Of them. That's a lot of work. Yeah, it's multi, and, and some, that's, that's some, multi days, right? That's not like something so, you do. No, it's a, it's a, it's a decades process. Yeah. Right? But so, you know, not everybody has to go into it as deeply as this. You can get a lot out of it with, you know, even just a few comments and or no comments. It's not it's not our only methodology, by the way. You can also just um, you can do the kind of open awareness practice I was describing. And I, I've got a training now that is really sort of gentler, you know, where it's, it's you're building up the foundations of mindfulness from early Buddhism. Then you're moving into discovering connection. Are you talking about the app that you're working on? Or? The app, got it. The app's got we, the We got to talk yeah. about that. You know, one of the things that I, I'm curious about with the, the, these koans is, um, you know, this is part of a, a lineage which started in, in Rinzai. Is that right? Koans uh, uh, originally started the Rinzai sect? Is that That's correct, right. Or? That's right. The koan method did. Right. Yeah. And so one of the things that scares people off, um, especially in my family. So my, I, my family grew up Lutheran, like hardcore Christian. Um, I can appreciate the teachings of Jesus, but I'm no longer a quote unquote Christian. Um, I think he had a lot of great things to say. If you go back to the core of a lot of those principles. Yes. Um, and, and when I told family members I'm studying Zen, a huge red flag goes up in the religious community saying that's Buddhism. That's praying to another God. Mm -hmm. That is another religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much of that is true? Yeah. And then how compatible is Zen with insert any religion? Yes, that's a great question. In a certain way, Zen is absolutely not a religion. It's about changing our hearts and minds. And there's, there are Zen masters who are friends of mine, or even a teacher of mine, who's a practicing Christian. No problem whatsoever. He says, Zen has made me a better Christian. 
hmm. un unquestionably in his mind. Um, it's a misconception from the Western view that all religions must be sort of praying to a deity. In fact, you know, in the, as late as 1840, uh, you had uh, a Western view that there were only four religions on earth. Mohammedanism, as they called it, this is a European view, uh, Ju Judaism, Christianity, and idolatry. Four religions. They, they just didn't understand. But now we understand much better that there's actually a thing called the spiritual life of a human being. And religions, of course, speak to that, but you don't even need a religion to speak to it, to address it. This, by spiritual life, I mean exactly the kind of things we've been talking about, about sort of studying the nature of who I am and how do I nourish my hurt heart, my wounded heart? How do I help it? How do I love it more? How do I find more love in life? How do I find, is there such a thing? Could there be such a thing as an intrinsic loving essence in every moment that somehow the very gift of this moment has some kind of love in it? And if there is, could it be that that isn't really a religious thing? Mm. It's something in the intrinsic nature of being, mm. in the intrinsic nature of consciousness. I say yes to all those things. There is a loving nature right here. There's a dimensionless aspect to right here. There's a selflessness right here. And all of that is, I mean, I, I'm not a religious person, you know, and on the other hand, actually I'm an atheist, actually, but I might be a pantheist, you know, where you think God's everything. Right. If there's a God, it's everything. But the idea of a sort of separate God I think there's, I mean, it can be very useful. And a lot, of course, a lot of people find all the support and, and nourishment they want in that. Mm -hmm. No problem. Do you but, think of, of prayer can be a form of meditation? Yes, I do. I do. And I love this idea, you know, in 18th century London, that um, enlightenment time, there was this famous figure, uh, Dr. Johnson or Samuel Johnson. He's a remarkable guy. Uh, you know, real learned, uh, brilliant guy. He said, uh, even if there's no God, because atheism was a current question at that time. He said, even if there's no God, we should still pray. It's good for us. Mm. But actually there's a value in the sort of a centering and stillness and supplication yeah. and surrender. That I mean, it's, it's, it's a, in some sense, like we do, people that don't pray get some form of that in journaling. In, yes. In yes. coming out and saying, this is my thoughts, my feelings, my desires, my hopes, my concerns. Yes. You know, they're not directing it towards a deity, yeah. but, but there, we've already seen the benefits of, of that uh, yes. studied quite well. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And there's also research now on chanting, mm. that when a group of people are chanting together, it's great that neuroscientifically oh my they've God. shown that, you know, everybody gets in this theta state or whatever. Oh my God. Know, so I was just in, in Mexico uh, for my wife's birthday and they had a, uh, a ceremony that you could sign up for that is one of these huts. Uh, it's called like Mezcalani ceremony, something like that, where it's in a hut, a, 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 a basically um, a stone complex, like a dome. Yeah. And you duck in to go into the little hole yeah. and they pile in hot rocks like uh -huh. over and over again. Then they shut the door yeah. and they steam the crap out of it. Yeah. And then they, they chant and there's drums and, the, and it's loud and reverberates in there. And you sing along and you start to pick up the lyrics and kind of sing along in these ancient chants. Yeah. And then you go around the room and open up about different things that are going on in your life, love, your great gratitude, the things you're feeling about. It is a very powerful thing to chant yes. with a group, yes, yes, especially in that environment. In that environment. It sounds like a sweat lodge. It is. It yeah. is very yeah. much. And yeah. it was a, it, there was no drugs involved. Yeah. But it was like I walked out of there being like, wow, that was as good as a deep therapy session. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's sort of purifying, mm -hmm. right? Well, actually, I mean, I, I did a whole phase of life with a lot of sweat lodges in it and loved that. Mm -hmm. But these days, you know, when I sit, when I just meditate, I get that kind of purifying sense. Mm -hmm. Even if it's been like a somewhat scattered sit, because I'm very loose and open about it. I don't mind if thoughts come, I just let it be as it is. But I get up 
from the seat where I've been meditating, however poorly, don't care. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a, something's, something's sort of cleaner. Mm. There's a little yeah. minor cleansing that, ah, yeah. you know, ready. You know? when, when you see so many students that come to you and say, I've had this cleansing moment, I've had this amazing thing, but for me, it's after I do an ayahuasca retreat. Or, <laughs> yeah. and I've never done yeah. that. I've been tempted by many friends. Yeah. Maybe one day I'll try it. I don't know. But I've tried other things as well. Yeah. You, um, have you tried these things to see how they compare to the state that you feel? Yes. And then also, how many of your students have done this? And yeah. where do you stand on psychedelics these days? Yeah, yeah. Interesting question. I mean, I think anything that helps is great. You know, and I, I think there's no question about the therapeutic value of psychedelics. Oh, for sure. Just no Especially thing. like PTSD, severe depression. There's some things where I look at and I'm like, why would you not? Exactly. If someone's going to kill themselves, they don't have 10 years to meditate yeah. to figure yeah. this out. And exactly. Like, let's get them some help right away. Exactly. And I'm also, I'm very interested in the combination of meditation and plant medicine. I think there's a lot of people looking at that now. I think strategic tactical use of plant medicine may be very helpful for somebody on a meditative path to achieve awakening loosen things up loosen mm. things up yeah and so on the path to awakening mm. i think i i mean actually i'll tell you i <laughs> i have some friends who are part of a kind of brotherhood that do occasional uh, psychedelic journeys and i was invited recently and uh, a few months back to try the five meo thing. Oh wow! Okay, and I've never tried that, but I've been I've been tempted. Well, I was curious because yeah, the accounts sound somewhat like the kind of awakening that I've experienced, and uh, and that I often sort of live in actually in a certain sense. So I tried it. Is that is it one question before you tell me about the results? <laughs> If I'm in your shoes and I'm like, okay, my day-to-day -day life is 5-AMEO DMT, <laughs> like I'm loving life, like I'm happy, yeah. it would scare the crap out of me that you might go into something that and a wire gets twisted and all of a sudden you're kicked out of your, your... Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, you, you, <laughs> you no, see what I I'm want, saying? No, because I'm, you know, my heart's being broken, mm. so it's open. Mm. So I'm not trying to hold anything together. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, wow. I believe a broken heart is is the first, we have to break our hearts. Then we can have an open heart. Mm. And then that means we have a whole heart. I see it as a sequence, mm. broken heart, open heart, whole heart. But you can't have a whole heart unless it's been broken. That's what I sincerely mm. believe now. So I wasn't worried about that at all. So, so I'll tell you what happened. I went almost immediately to where I just often go. Wait, well, so this is where you, yeah, you, you take it from a vein, hold it in for as yeah, long as you can seconds. and maybe try and take a second one if you can kind no, of thing. I think we is did it? two. Okay. Like 10 seconds in, 10 seconds hold, 10 seconds out. And I just sort of glided off to where I quite often go in meditation, where basically there isn't anything except an intense love in my heart area. Mm. I don't really, it's not like I'm very conscious of the body. So it doesn't feel like this is my heart area, mm. but somewhere in the middle, this deep, powerful, right. tender, exquisite, overwhelming love and nothing else, literally nothing else. That's not the experience for everyone that does 5-AMEO DMT. No, I, I... Some people see frog gods and all kinds of weird shit. So yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you have a very There's... specific, clean well, experience, it sounds I, like. I'm, I'm, yeah, maybe if I did it again, it'd be different. But I think in a way that I, I've done a lot of kinds of work over the years yeah. and I think probably I've got to a point where there's less to work through I mean I maybe I'm wrong and life will prove me wrong if I am wrong for sure I say those words with a little trepidation but maybe I'm right you know mm -hmm. there's less to work through so it, but but what what I what I loved about it was um that maybe people can get um some taste of the of this love i'm talking about mm -hmm. that way where it's just we're just finding that all we got to do is surrender in this incredible you know i don't I, I feel it's the love of the universe i think the universe is one great organ of love that i think i mean i don't know how we'd ever prove it but the fact that it's 
creating itself mm -hmm. and we're part of it. And actually we do have a special place, I think, even though it's just evolutionary happenstance, but we are more aware mm. and we can communicate about being aware. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that is a step up from, uh, you know, grasshoppers, you know, whatever, you know, I mean, right. in a sense that the nervous system has got to the point the neurology has got to the point where we can be aware that we are aware mm -hmm. and we can connect with each other about it. And I think we can be aware that we are the whole universe, not as an idea, but as an actual experience. And do you see that as, um, as a, as a kind of like, a carrot to get people to embrace a serious practice because in my yeah. experience like i've had so many friends that um that have done ayahuasca and they've said oh my god like i ego does uh, ego um uh what do they call it like a ego death has occurred and for 48 hours they got that halo effect and they have their life is forever good and then two weeks later it's like well you know maybe i'll do another one next month and then all of a sudden, I've talked to some friends that are like, you know, 75 sessions plus deep into this same thing. Whereas I wonder to myself, is that just a temporary state versus a dedicated multi-decade meditation? Seems like a gradual permanent rewiring yes. versus a short duration fix, which might be good to say, hey, I can see the mountain now. I, a helicopter took me up there and I stood on the mountaintop and I was like, holy shit. Yeah. But then the helicopter quickly took me back down to the base yeah. versus what you're talking about sounds like a lot more durable yeah. in terms of when there's an awake, a deep awakening moment with Zen that is going to be something where I won't have to go yeah. back to doing yeah. a special ceremony to experience more or less the same yeah. thing, but maybe even yeah. at a deeper level. Yeah. Would you consider I mean, I that to be accurate or you know i hate to make um sort of uh declarations yeah. that might not work out for people sure but i think it is basically like you said i think the the promise of a long-term meditation practice can be um that you 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 come to experience your ordinary moment your ordinary awareness your ordinary state of things in a very different way. Mm. So you therefore don't need wonderfully different experiences. Right. It's about your very, I mean, I'm talking about now, always this very, you know, it's, it's a little unusual. We're sitting here chatting with, with your mics and stuff and having a, what will be a public conversation, but that doesn't matter because actually it's just two of us in a room and the three of us with an engineer, you know, and, and this, 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 other dimension is totally present. In other words, it's present regardless mm. of circumstance. And you don't have to be in some heightened state or altered state mm. to know it. It's just, so I think the path of sort of, I, I, and we talked about that word study earlier, like it is a kind of examination of your own experience. Mm -hmm. And over time, just through, you know, through the stillness and through being without words, actually, for a chunk of time each day. Of course, there may be words in the mind, but over time, it'll get quieter. And you can just be with your ordinary experience with no outside input. And gradually, it just, it just opens. It softens and tenderizes and opens and we start having a wider sense of wow. Mm. And, and it, it may have sudden jump in that process. And, um, but mostly it's a gradual deepening, broadening, clarifying of what this moment is. And it's not unusual, if you see what I mean. So that, it, you know, it's not an odd thing we're going to. It's in the heart of mm. ordinariness. That, that's a really interesting way that you put it. It's not a thing that we're going to because one of the things that I worry about is that you, you, I showed you my library when we went upstairs a few minutes ago and you, you had pointed out a bunch of the Zen books that I have. That's book knowledge that I'm picking up, right? <clears throat> and of course the seat's there and that's, that's the place I should be focusing my efforts. <laughs> but there's a lot of book yeah. knowledge sitting on that shelf, right? And 
in some sense, there's this, this like idea that I can intellectually get my way to a better state of mind by understanding something. And one time I heard you experience, someone asked you the question of what are we? And you said, oftentimes it's better to ask the, the question, not, not really what are we and not hold on to this idea of what we are, but you called it the finger by finger letting go of who we think we are. Yeah. And so it's the exact opposite of book knowledge and trying to figure something out, yeah. but it's more about releasing. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. I mean, first of all, I just want to say books are great for inspiration, for encouragement, for sometimes course correction. And it's actually fine to have some understanding of why I'm doing this, you know, to have that kind of, you know, knowledge, well, yeah, understanding, view, you know, yeah, there's a lot of suffering in the world. I suffer, friends suffer, the whole community of the human beings is suffering. Can we create less suffering? What would it take to do that? And how can I be part of the project of less suffering, a more compassionate world with less violence and all the hideous things that go on by us humans, you know? So understanding is not bad by any means, but the process of, of releasing is, it's, it, you're absolutely right. It's like, um, rather than it being, I'm going to find X, it's more, I'm going to just loosen my hold on Y, like the, the letter Y, I meant, you know, X, Y. So just letting, gradually just being softer in my sense of who I am and what things are. So I suppose it's a different kind of use of the word understanding. There's understanding in the sense of like getting oriented for why I'm doing this practice and how this might work and the pra specific practices I'm doing, how they might work, that kind of understanding and getting inspired and encouraged, which man we need, you know, it's a long journey. But then on the other hand, there's the way I construct experience is actually conditioned. And uh, none of us probably would believe that. We think we got it right. I know I'm in here and I know the world's out there. Well, actually, not so fast. You know, it can be experienced differently and, and it can just show itself very naturally that actually we're part of mm -hmm. what we think we're, we're outside of or separate from. And that comes through gently releasing, a process of releasing. And it's true, sudden, sometimes it's sudden. You know, we, we don't know how, but something let go. Mm. There's an openness that we never knew could happen. Mm. And the world floods in and, you know, we love it and it loves us and in a most remarkable way. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's beautiful. Um, I'm curious, after, after coaching so many students you know, when I talk about my practice comes up from time to time with other entrepreneurs or people that I'm, I'm interacting with. And the number one thing people say, I'm sure you've heard this is just, I don't have time. I'm just too busy. Yeah. Yeah. How, is it something where you, you tell a student, like maybe just now isn't the time for you to take up a practice or are there actual strategies that for someone that is start and stop, start, I've tried headspace for 10 minutes. I've done this. I've done what is it that actually works there? What creates a real sticky, lasting, multi-decade commitment to a practice? Yes. Especially because I would say that most practice, in my mind, it was like at least a year in to my commitment during COVID. Thank thankfully, there well, not thankfully there was COVID, but thankfully COVID gave me the time to have a practice because yeah. I could work from home more. And it, was, it wasn't like there was this aha moment, but I felt a little bit more at ease and I was starting to see some benefit, but that's like six, eight, 12 months in. Yeah. Most people are not going to stick around that long. Yeah. 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 How, how do you get, how do you convince people to turn this into something that they're not finding time for, but they're making time for it? Yes. That's, the, that's exactly the right terminology actually, is that, I mean, it's like any habit, you know, we, we have to decide we want it. We have to reinforce it. We have to make it easier. Uh, we, it's really helpful to have some guidance. I think a lot of people actually in early meditation stages benefit from guided meditations. 
because you can have a better mm-hmm. time quicker if you so that's that's where apps come in yes you know and um i don't know do we want to talk about the 100 oh, percent. Or... so this is what i'm really excited to talk about so in full disclosure you and i've been friends for a while now you've been a fantastic mentor and coach to me uh over the years and um you and i had always kind of like talked about like wouldn't it be cool? Because you started doing more Zoom stuff during COVID. And, and you were having these classes that were showing up and they were well attended. Yeah. And it, it, I remember we were thinking like, well, you should build something. You should build something that's a little bit, because all these apps in, in my, um, you know, as a venture capitalist, when I go out and look at the landscape of apps, uh, and I don't want to call anyone out because I think there is a time and place for every type of app. When I see an app that uh, puts you, helps put you to sleep, and gives you some really good strategies for sleep. Fantastic, yeah. right? Um, but I, I, I had, you know, and you had seen a, a gap in this space where it, there wasn't really, it was almost like everything was a choose your own adventure. And with that can cause a little bit of, you know, almost anxiety in the sense that like, huh, well, where do I go today? And then a lot of them are like, well, how can I do the most viral loop to pull you in? Which is sometimes like, you know, a one minute meditation. It was like, it felt like a race to the bottom in terms of just do less and less and less. And we're going to add journaling in and we're going to add some other stuff. And, you know, when I, when I started studying under you with Zen, I thought, wow, wow, here's something, something so much deeper. And for those that crave it, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if there was a product that would, that would address that market. And so you went off and created something new. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Yes. Well, we do have this app called The Way which is, a, we think it's a first of a kind meditation app where what, what the distinguishing feature of it is that it's a single pathway. You don't really have, I'm afraid to so say, you don't have a lot of choice. <laughs> but the, on the plus side, you're being guided gently, day by day, step by step, deeper into the realms that meditation can open up. But it is very gradual. You know, we, we cover... We want you to get grounded in mindfulness so you really know what it is to be present to your own, uh, how to handle difficult emotion, be with it, how to be more appreciative of sense experience in the moment and more, just more aware of here and now. Then we go into discovering support and connection, which is a critical part of meditation. You know, often we think of it as a solitary pursuit. We have ideals like the lone adept in a cave on a mountain or something. Actually, no, meditation is about drawing support from many sources, you know, not being alone, actually. In fact, overall, the journey is one of, of being more and more part of the world, belonging more mm. and more. Then we also have a sort of stage of going into flow states in meditation, which is beautiful, where you find, you know, this present moment is utterly fulfilling, mm. just without, without anything, just being. You know, it's beautiful. It's very, it's like flow, mm-hmm. you know, and that people can find in activities, uh, but you can do it in meditation. And then there's awakening, glimpses of less, being less, to, less attached to self, less attached to my I- idea of me, little hints of the, the greater awareness that's holding us, that's always here, falling into it more. So it's a gradual path. Mm-hmm. Of, of, of tasting these different flavors, and, but all leading towards, you know, a more of a losing the sense of separateness. You know? is, is your hope that this will be that long term? And, and I know there's no such thing as knowing. It's not like you can say, hey, get to lesson number 50 and pop, you're, you're going to have this moment, right? Because it, yeah. it, it can be random. Yeah. It is, I guess, yeah. more or less random, but when someone would experience this deeper type of awareness and awakening, um, is it your hope that this will be an app that leads to those type of events? Yeah, I, I, hope, it'll, I hope it'll lead to various kinds of shifts and openings and events in people's lives, um, including those. What we're going to do is actually we loop round and round. So we go through the mindfulness to awakening path again and again deeper and deeper over mm. time and it's multi-year is the is the plan mm. and that along the way you get more and more 
little openings, you know, so it may not be huge major ones, you know, mm -hmm. just little shifts that, that was nice, you know, just, oh man, I was silent. My mind was silent throughout that sit. Well, that's a really nice thing. It may not be blinding cosmic revelation, but it's lovely yeah. to find, oh, and this peace kind of carried me through my day, totally unexpectedly. Where did that yeah. come from? Well, it came from your practice because yeah. you were doing it. So I want people to have all these yeah. different but Those are beautiful registers. moments. It's like, I, I'm not, as you know, I've not had one of these awakening moments, but I, I have had these glimpses of just general ease that was not there prior to having a dedicated practice. Right. And it's just like, that alone is like, worth it all <laughs> we're, that's, that's and we're only talking about like you know i'm sitting 25 minutes a day yeah. but you when you start the app you're actually you you start people off around eight to ten minutes something yeah, like that. ten minutes a day ten minutes a day, ten minutes a day. yeah and we'll very gradually invite longer yes if they want it you and know? you have talks interspersed there as well so we it's like it's not just meditation 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 it's yeah. there's knowledge as well that comes along the way yeah a little bit of orientation and guidance yeah and encouragement which we all need but it but it actually, you can see the pathway, you know, there's four sort of like mountains that we, we, you're going to go through. And each one has these little sets. We call them retreats. Each retreat has a cluster of meditation sessions. You can sort of see what's coming and what you're going to be doing. But you have to go step by step. <laughs> it's so you know, we, so we, we think it's a style. training. We think it's a training. I think it's a fantastic idea because it's, it's like, I just want, and many people, especially in a busy world, we just want to have just lead us, you know, yeah. lead us yeah. and like help us. You've been down this path, you you know, the twists and turns and like, but having that, that dedicated, like single focus is going to be so key. Do you, do you think you'll ever tie this up with like, how much of this do you think is, um, is doable? I, I know you've done a lot of zoom testing mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. How much of this is doable via video, via app? And then will there ever be a component, and maybe we're getting a little too far out, but would there ever be a physical like retreat component to this where you could see yes. members of the way getting together annually for some type of yeah. real in-person event? Yeah, we'd really like that to happen. I mean, we have the online digital training that I've been offering the last two, three years. Um, it's actually having its first in-person event in January, late Amazing. January. Yeah, a three day. And um, obviously, We'll see how that goes, but the moment we launched it, it was fifty percent filled. You know, you're so. going to need a bigger space. <laughs> you're going to have to take Mountain Cloud Zen Center and do some expansion. <laughs> I think it could really happen, but yeah, so that will be part of it, probably. But we, um, but I really want it to be sufficient. You know, my my real hope and intention is that if somebody, if all they can do is ten minutes a day, that's great, and and because of following this curated path, those 10 minutes a day are actually going to lead you. They're going to be taking you somewhere. It's mm. not just same de-stress every day, which mm. hopefully, we hope you'll get. It's actually, you know, you're really on a journey. Mm. And, and if, that, if that journey is enough for you at 10 minutes a day, terrific. Yeah. I really hope it will be. And if you want more, there'll be ways you can plug into more. Because our Zoom events are going to carry on. Yeah. You know, every other Sunday or something like that in, in the next couple of years. So people from the app can always join those if they want that additional boost, a little bit more time uh, and see other people be in a gathering that's not physical, but it is still, it feels weirdly supportive, the mm -hmm. Zoom gatherings that we've been having with that's a fantastic. few hundred people, you know, and, and that, that'll, that'll, uh, that'll carry on as a, as a resource. The, um, the app is slated to come out late January. Yeah. This podcast is slated to come out mid to late January, right around the corner. If for some reason uh, the app is not out, uh, I will put a link in the show notes to the beta link so they can sign up and actually get on the app early and play. Because we'll have yeah. the latest beta to provide to people so we can, yeah. people that are watching. But it should be available in the App Store. But the easiest way to do that um, is going to be to go over to thewayapp.com. Correct. So that's, that's the website. So if you want to okay. see the current state of it and have a link to download it. It'll be the wayapp.com, which is, which is awesome. 
Yeah, and you can get, you can pre-order it and be ready for it. Yeah. So, oh, that's right. Yeah, you can yeah. you can say deliver this to me when it's when it's out. Yeah. Fantastic. Exactly. Um, it's going to be so cool. I'm I'm thrilled for you, Henry. This is like and in actually I want to touch touch on one thing that you may not that's a little sensitive. Uh, you have not wanted to be called a Zen master before. I've heard you say like, it, does it make you uncomfortable to be called a Zen master? Because you are a fully accredited, mm. fully sanctioned from Japan, Roshi. Which yeah. is a true Zen master? Is that not? Yes, right? it's, I suppose it's. I suppose it's, it's technically true. <laughs> it's officially or technically true. And you're only one of a few in the United States. Yeah, it's true. Well, I think in the in the U.S. there's very few actually. In the world, there's only four or five of us sanctioned by this particular lineage in the way, in that way. But um, honestly, I you know it's it's the word master that suggests I'm really on top of it infallibly and that's not the case and I don't even aspire to that I mm. you know like I was saying earlier the only thing that I try to do and don't do perfectly by any means is be fully fully open-hearted you know have a very open heart and I, what I call wholehearted mm. where I can I'm ready to feel whatever wants to be felt. I need more of that. My wife, my wife would be really happy if I had more of that. Well, honestly, I think one of the misconceptions also about that word Zen is that it means some kind of you're above it all, you're, you're in a serene equanimity right, that isn't right. touched by the world. I'm rubbish. That's not what it means. It's, it's the opposite. It's being ready to, I mean, I, I've been so, feeling so much around Gaza and you know, yeah. the horrors there and, 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 and of course the horrors of October 7th, no less. And yeah. there's sufferings everywhere. I mean, when I think that my grandparents on my father's side, you know, they were Jewish. They left Poland, Ukraine in the early 20th century. You know, they, they had my dad very late and, you know, and, and they, I mean, late in life. And so they, but they'd fled the pogroms, all that right. suffering and misery and persecution to think what, what would they think if they saw what, what, what's going on in Gaza mm. right now? The horror that, that, that's being perpetrated on the inhabitants there. And the idea that that kind of remorseless violence is gonna achieve anything good. Mm. You know, it's, and I feel it. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm sure many of us do, but I, I, want, it, I want to feel it. Uh, and I wanna be, you know, whatever, whatever, the extent this app might be an offering that will reduce suffering mm. just a little bit yeah. is, is all I hope for it. That the, yeah. I think the more, the, the more of us, the more we find peace in ourselves and, and, a, and an ease and, an, and a wholeheartedness, you know, frankly, a love that is non-conditional, mm. an unconditional love. The more, the more of us taste that and the more that we do taste it, I think the better. Mm. It, it's, not a, it's not enough, but it's something. Yeah. And I think, you know, because we got to do something. You know, yeah. this, we're a, such a fucked up species. Yeah. You know, we're in a, a, the most amazing species in, yeah. in our way. But we're so messed up. Oh, this man. toxicity that we carry is. I think about AI and I'm just like, it's going to usher in so many amazing things and also so many destructive things. And so as a technologist, I'm like sitting with that. And then it's, it's, it's a lot when you can see and you know what's coming in the next five years. And it's going to be crushing for a lot of people. Right. And it's also going to cure cancers. Like, and right. so it's right. like. But why, why couldn't what we're doing with the way harness some of that and yeah. be, I mean, imagine if AI can tell us quicker how to help people get these shifts. I've, I've, you know? I've thought about that deeply because one of the things that I know is coming is um, taking large corpuses of data yeah. and feeding it into AI uh, and being able to ask questions of that data in real time. Right. So 
you have a podcast we should also talk about uh, the mountain cloud zen center podcast yeah um it's where you do your dharma talks which are essentially talks that you do your, to your community so it's mm -hmm. a very kind of intimate thing meaning yeah. like you're you're actually zendo community um yeah. they're not like stage talks they're like they're not stage talks yeah no. yeah they're, but they go to thousands of people tune into yes them, but they're fantastic yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I listen to i listen to a lot of them uh, when i jump the sauna i put one on and i'm always <laughs> i'm always like i wish i had a pen and read some of these nuggets but the cool thing about that is in the next year to two years maybe even less we'll be able to feed all of that content into ai right it will understand it all and i can have a conversation with you the ai version of you based on what you've said throughout the years in right. your talks. Uh, and so that uh, at some point will make its way into your app as well, yes, right? Yes. And so that's a really fascinating idea where I'm gonna say, gosh, Henry, uh, you know, I had one too many drinks last night. Uh, I'm struggling with alcohol. What are your thoughts? And you'll somewhere in one of your talks, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm just making yeah. this up, yeah. but yeah. like there might yeah. be a point yeah. where you reference yeah. and had a conversation about that. Yeah. It can bring the clips in, yes. your perspective in, hopefully yeah. in an accurate way. Yeah. And, <laughs> and really provide yeah. people with some guidance. Speaking of which, I got to touch on that real quick. One of the funniest things and biggest shifts for me <laughs> I was talking to you about drinking alcohol one time and I was like, I like, I like some champagne. I like to have a drink at night, especially after a long day, you know? And I'm like, Henry, do you, do you drink? Like what's going on? And you were like, you said something to the effect that it makes, it dulls life down to a point where it's less enjoyable if you were to get drunk, like where your everyday life is better than what a drink can provide for you. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think that, I think that's Like if that's you drink, correct. you're like, this is, a, this is not as good as what I'm experiencing without drinking. I'm just checking that out. I think that's basically true. That's yeah? amazing. But on the other hand, I actually, I actually love, and I don't, I haven't done it in, I've, I don't do it anymore actually, but I would love a glass of beer. Right. You know? So it's but not what, forbidden, but it's just like, you don't take it to an extreme. No, I, I would get that there's a little buzz, you know, for the first little while. They call the, the champagne bit. effect, like the, okay. when you first yeah. have that first it's, sip, and exactly. it's like, pops yeah. your brain. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's enjoyable. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, there's no sense that I need that. Because you used to drink. I, yeah, I've had, I mean, I, you know, I started adult life as a, you know, as, as I said, as a You're poet, in the UK. And a writer in the UK. Yeah, so you were drinking a lot. And that whole literary scene was just, it happened in the pub. Yeah. Basically, you know. And there was heavy drinking and I, I was part of that. But what happens when you get to a certain level of Zen where that falls away? Cause your, your advice to me one time is I said, oh, I should, I should quit drinking or I should limit it. And you said, Kevin, if you practice, it will kind of naturally. Yeah, happen. exactly. Like, you, you don't really need to make it go away. You just won't want to as much. You don't have to cut it out. I mean, my master in Japan, who's, you know, has been a very successful businessman all his life. Yeah. Um, he, he drinks. You know, oh, Japanese business culture is notorious for drinking. Right. He, I don't think he goes heavy. Yeah. But, but Will, I've, I've been had... out and done some deals in Japan, and yeah. it's always over beers and Japanese whiskey in a smoky, like, filled room, right. you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine he must have been there. Yeah. But, I mean, I've never, I think these days, you know, he is very light, but he does, he does have the old glass of wine. You yeah. Know, he likes a glass of champagne. Mm -hmm. And, um... It's, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a problem. It's sort of a, it's not in order to feel better. We mm -hmm. could say it like that. Interesting. Like the, actually, if you, um, I mean, he, he, he's told me that he'll come back from work, tired, a little, maybe a little stressed, just have a sit. And it, it all drains out. And it's, he's, and it's as if he's just been in a, in a spa or something. It's drained out. Ah, lovely. It's you know, interesting feeling you good. say that because that is my one rule that I have where I say to myself, let's say it's six o'clock and let's just say it was a brutal day. It's like back to back meetings, community is blowing up in some weird way. Something's happening. I feel emotionally drained. Yeah. And I haven't had a sit. Yeah. I will make it a rule where I say, yes, that glass of champagne is downstairs, but I'm going to sit first. Yeah. Oh, good. And I, yeah. and I sit first Yes. and I do it. And, you know, often more than not, I will go down and say, Hey, we're having a meal. I'm going to have that glass of champagne still. Yes. But at least I, it's like a forcing, like I said, I, I'm going to take care of myself first on that level. That's great. Yeah. That's very good. Very good. Uh, that's okay. very good. 
gold star. That's the right thing to do. Okay. Because you get, you get the, you actually get, you get rid of the need and then you can go and enjoy it. Right. You know, which is even better. Yeah. And there's also that, that weird pleasure in deferring a pleasure. Right. You know, that we show we've got the self-control to wait. Yes. And that actually feels good. Yes. Do, do you know what I mean? There's yes. a sort of, like it's a little bit stoic maybe that yeah. you just don't actually just reach for it the instant you want it. And then there's, there's actually this pleasure in, oh yeah, I can control myself. Right. That's, that feels good. Yeah. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah it's right. just, it's like a, it's a feather on the cap of like, I, I made it to that. I didn't have to immediately jump into that. And it's funny, my, my, my therapist has this thing where like, I, I, she said, great, you may want to drink or you may want, or you have in, insert anything like a fear of turbulence or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. Just sit with it for a minute and just, just observe it. Right. And just journal about it. How yeah, are you feeling? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where's the feeling? Yes. Where, where's it coming up? Blah, blah. And she goes, you finish that for 10 minutes. Go have that drink if you want it. Yes. But, but you've noted it down. Yeah. And, and, and there's something to that that leads to, uh, I think, slowly uh, an understanding of the motivations that are hidden behind why you're driven to do that in the first place. Exactly. That's a great therapist. Yeah. She, yeah, she's an amazing therapist. And that's really compatible with meditation, where we're getting more aware. Yeah. So that would include awareness of our sort of impulses and yearnings. Yeah. You know, wanting this, wanting that. Couple, I know yeah. we got to go and wrap things up, but I have a couple really kind of insane questions for you that I wanted to run by you just because it's stuff that I've come across over the last couple of years in the world of Zen. And I've said to myself, how is this possible? And I know anytime we read any type of historic, especially, you know, texts that are thousands of years old. There could be either parables that are like exaggerated or just things that like, you're like, okay, that person didn't chop off that person's arm when they're telling the story about, yeah. you oh, know, yeah. about greed or whatever. Like yeah. It, yeah. it was just an example, right? Yeah. And so I want to know if this stuff in your, from your point of view, if there's any truth to it, or do you just consider it to be part of the lore of what, what Zen is, right? Yeah. Um, they're in the three pillars of Zen. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've read yeah, the book. Yeah, familiar yeah, with it. Yeah. Um, there is a quote here that I wanted to read to you that I just didn't quite wasn't able to wrap my head around. Okay, okay. let me see if I can shed light on it or not. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we'll maybe see. you can, yeah. but like yeah. I just want to know if, like, given your background, like, is there yeah. anything here that you can comment on? Yeah. Um, it goes something like this. It says, um, and this is a, 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 a bit into the book. It says the second of the five kinds of Zen is called Gido. Gado. Gado. Yeah. Okay. Gado literally uh, means literally an outside way. And then it goes on to say, another feature of Gado Zen is that it is often practiced in order to cultivate various supernormal powers or skills uh, or to master arts beyond the reach of the ordinary person. An example of this is the Tempu Nakamura, the man who I mentioned earlier. It is reported that he can make people act without moving a muscle or saying a word. The aim of the Emma method is to accomplish such feats as walking barefoot on sharp, sharp sword blades or staring at sparrows that they become paralyzed. All these miraculous exploits are brought about through the cultivation of Joriki, the uh, particular strength or power which comes from strenuous practice of mind concentration. Can you paralyze sparrows with your mind? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Have you ever seen Kung Fu, the old um, TV show from ba the 1970s? Back in the day? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, Grasshopper and all that. Oh, those are fun to watch just like yeah. on the background, leaving playing. That, that's, that's, that's what they're talking about there. Really. So, I mean, no, this is not part of Zen. Okay. It's so like, it's, I mean, kind of, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just play. legend. Legend. I mean, okay. I mean, but on the other hand, it's kind of cool that maybe, I mean, you know, in Kung Fu, look at the way the blind old guy could fight with right, a stick, right. kill 14 brigands, you know, without even seeing them. Do you feel any of that is true? Do you get any sense of like, you you'd mentioned earlier this idea that, you know, there's no separation. Yeah. If there's no separation, is there control of external 
things. But the thing is, but the thing is, if you think in a way, if you're thinking of controlling something, that you're separate from it. So I think this discovery Damn you with your Zen knowledge. It's like it's more like if you're if you're really in this experience of, of oneness, they sometimes call right. It, you know, you're you're not there. Right. Is it part, it, so you're areas. separating yourself. So it's not really oneness. I, I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but I yeah, think it's, it's. And I think I do re have read about. I don't know. I've just read the odd story of people who did sort of manipulate meditation to to get some kind of dark power or something like that. Which that sort of sounds like maybe yeah, yeah. that's not particularly dark, but paralyzing a sparrow seems relatively innocent. Versus some of the kind of unless you're the sparrow and you're like, what the hell's going on again? Move here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, true. But um, you know, did you see that movie Spring, Summer, Winter? Yes, whatever. That was a fantastic movie. I love that movie. I love that too. But remember how that guy could make the boat move? Yes. You know, so I mean, it's more like I think we're into the realm of was it Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's kung fu, really. Right. I think you know, it's more in that realm. Okay. I wanted to gut check that with you. And this one is, this one's a little bit harder because it is real yeah. in that um, I have the actual uh, notes on it here. So the, in, in the 1990s, 1992, there was a very famous alternative rock band, uh, still very famous, called Rage Against the Machine. Uh -huh. um, they had a cover, an album cover that looked like that. So, oh man, yeah, that's, that is, is that Vietnam? That is a man is, that's, that's in Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. named Thich oh. Quan Doc. Uh, and on June 11th, 1963, yeah. he was protesting the persecution of Buddhists by the U.S. backed South Vietnamese government. Yeah. Um, the picture went, you know, the equivalent of whatever viral would be today. Yeah. He, the story goes something like this. And he was protesting, hundreds of people around, pulled out a mat, yeah. dumped gasoline on his head, yeah. struck the match on his, on his own will, yeah. and lit himself on fire. Yeah. Everyone that witnessed it, yeah. not a single scream, yeah. not a single screech, nothing, yeah. burned for 11 minutes, yeah. fell over backwards, yeah. and had passed away. Yeah. Um, that is an extreme sacrifice. It is an extreme statement. But it is also, as someone that burns the tip of my finger on a stove and freaks out because of the sheer pain yeah. of even a quarter inch of a severe burn, yeah. how can someone's brain shut off pain like that? Yeah. Well, I would guess that it didn't shut off pain, but it didn't mind pain. In other words, he had developed what we call equanimity, which is not mind, where you, you're not trying to have nice experiences and you're not trying to push away unpleasant experiences by getting into a state of very deep samadhi. You know, I was talking about those flow states mm -hmm. in meditation. They're known as samadhi mm -hmm. or jhana as well. If you get very, 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 very thoroughly absorbed and you might, with the additional impetus of the cause, of doing something for intensely suffering people. This was not for him. Mm. This was for the whole nation and the whole communities that he felt he was representing and belonged to who were suffering intensely. And for their sake, in other words, it's selfless from the start. So with, with less self, we, we, I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I have no idea about the, that kind of intense yeah. pain. But I can sort of understand that it, it might well be possible yeah. for a very seasoned meditator. That's just Acting for this on behalf of others. Yeah. You know, really, really sacrificing themselves. And we can argue about, well, is that a, is that a good kind of self-sacrifice or whatever? We could, you know, who knows? Sure. But aside from that, just how to do it. I mean, it's a remarkable, it's, a most, it's, it's an extraordinary act to be so... Right so giving up of your own life. I mean, there's the stories in the, there's this, there's these tales about Buddha, uh, you know, that developed sort of in the course of Buddhist history and about, they had the reincarnationist view back then. Mm. So there's stories about his former lives 
and uh, that he lived. And there's one of them where he was a rabbit who came across a family that was starving and they had a little fire, they were huddled around. And in this tale, he just leapt onto the fire so they could eat. Mm. You know, that, that, I mean, you know, whatever, you know, this sort of folk tale or whatever right. it is, but it, it's, it's a similar sense of that, I, I'm going to give up my life, your life is what I care about. Wow. And that's, that's the spirit of, I, I, I can't claim to be anywhere near there, but that's the spirit of what we call a bodhisattva in, in the word, the meaning of the word changed over time, but the later meaning of the word uh, from about 2000 years ago onwards has been a, a, a being who is more concerned with the well-being of others yeah. than of themselves. And that's, I mean, it's actually, it's an incredible thing to aspire to, you know, just to, especially in our culture where it's, it's so counterintuitive mm. that there might be a path to happiness that wasn't about getting more for me, mm. but more about helping others, helping others flourish, yeah. to be joyous at the successes of others and to be wishing them having their hearts fulfilled and, and, and met, meeting their hearts desires, wanting that and wanting others to be free from suffering, you know, as opposed to my suffering, yeah. my wanting, you know, you know, that what a shift that might be. And it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's not what we're conditioned in our modern world it's to, to really regard as a way to, to happiness. But it could be that we've really got it back to front, that the, our normal way of trying to get happy uh, won't actually ever work. Mm. We'll get hit of, you know, oh, I got this, great. And then the hit's gone and we need it again. And, but those aren't real happiness. You know, it's... I remember hearing the Dalai Lama, this, you know, who was, he actually came to Santa Fe one. Mm. And he, he was really excited to know about skiing. And a friend of mine actually was, was his sort of guide for the 24 hours or something that he was in town. And he was very sort of, he shyly asked after he'd done various, we've got these certain meetings, meeting the mayor or the this or that, you know, but do you think we might be able to go up the mountain? I want to see the ski. Ski slope. Mm -hmm. Santa Fe has a ski slope. Yeah, and and so they arranged it, and 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 then you know he he rode the chairlift with robes and was yeah, right, right. <laughs> And then afterwards he was in the they went to have a cup of hot chocolate or something in the cafeteria, and he was he he wanted to talk to the the waitress. You know, you know how are you, my dear? What what you know, just engaged her, and she said, oh, "I'm so honoured to meet you. Can I ask you a question? You know what what is the meaning of life what is the purpose of life and he said oh it's very easy purpose of life meaning of life is to be happy but how to be happy? that's not so simple this is this was recorded in the newspaper i yeah. remember reading it and um you know the point is that the ways that we think we'll find happiness we might have it back to front where we think by getting what mm. we want and pushing away what we don't want that's the path to happiness. Mm. And it's very natural and very understandable, but it could be that there's another way that's actually deep, which requires us to let go of that. And then we find that we're part of something already, which gives us basically an infinite mm. amount of happiness, mm. an infinite happiness. In other words, we don't know the end of the happiness that can come when we release our our hold on our sense of self. Mm. It's, it's actually literally a limitless happiness. I, I really, I find that. I, 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 f I find that to be like, it speaks so deeply to me because, you know, I've, as, as a technologist and a builder over the years, I, I've been very fortunate in that I've made some right decisions and, and had some good monetary wins. And every time I have bought something, especially in my, call it, early thirties where I just all of a sudden had a, a windfall from a, some company going public or something. Yeah. And I would immediately follow it up with something physical, you know, and you get this buzz for 48 hours and then you realize it's just so hollow yeah. and it's just a show. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, what about that? It, 
it's it's just so silly sometimes yeah. how we get caught up in things. And then that later was social media. How can I get more followers? How can I get more likes? How can I get more this and that? And we got to be careful. And I'm glad we have yeah. a guide like you to help us <laughs> disconnect from some of that. Yeah. And, and rethink that because it's so, it's so important. It is. But, you know, Kevin, it's not silly in the sense that um, we, it's, you know, it's, that, it's millions of years of evolution. We like the shiny thing. We it's, like the... It, except the shiny thing with social media is every time you open the app due to the algorithm. I have this, I have this crazy theory that like, so if you think about, uh, imagine like, remember like, like, let's call it the 90s and you go out with a friend and you hang out and something funny comes up and you just laugh your ass off because with, you're with a good buddy, right? And it was a fantastic time. Or you're watching the, you know, dating myself with the 11 o'clock news or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you see something ridiculous that makes you laugh. And then there was that funny show, America's Funny Home Videos that came out where you'd see more of these funny clips. Yeah. And it was a really well watched show because yeah. people like to laugh at the hilarious person falling off the trampoline or whatever it may be. Yeah. Then today you have a product that you open up and it literally is putting the absolute most viral content specifically designed for you yeah. and making you laugh over and over, you're having one of the best days of your life yeah. every 30 seconds. Something that you just have to wait weeks for yeah. every 30 seconds. Right. And then when you go without that, yeah. you put that device away, you're like, well, wait a second. Yes. I want to have more of the best day of my life. Yeah. I need to pick this up so yeah. I can get that stimulation, that aha moment, that laughter, that you know, connection. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm really concerned about that. Yeah, so it's just playing to this addictive nature yes. of wanting the fix. Yes, wanting right. the fix. So, so how do we counteract that? Right. I think, honestly, putting an app on a phone, which people are using all the time, that is taking them on a journey back to themselves. Yes. Where the satisfaction is already here. Yeah. The satisfaction that we can find, I mean, the fulfillment, like we needing no more mm -hmm. that we can find in just being. That's what the meditative path is really for. It's that, so you don't need, actually. It's to do away with need. Yes, you need water, you need food, you need more. But basically, what if that's it? Right. That you could just be. I mean, do you see the, the difference? You don't need to take in anything, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's champagne or social media or Ferrari. You just, you might choose. I never bought a Ferrari for the record. I never <laughs> <Okay>. bought a Ferrari. <laughs> Uh, well, you, Henry, for the record, you don't need, you know, you, yeah. you, you, sorry, you don't need those things because you're already, you might choose it, yeah, but you don't need it. Right. Why? Because you're already totally fulfilled. That's, that's what is, I mean, and this is not some pie in the sky or like, oh, you got to do 40 years of arduous training. No, it can be found relatively easily with the right guidance. That, right. That's what we're trying to, that's what I'm trying to offer, really. Uh, I'm so excited for it. Um, well, let's wrap things up. I, I wanted yeah. to um, plug a couple of things. You know, like we said, the wayapp.com is the place to go to check out this app. It's going to be awesome. Also, mm -hmm. you've previously written a book that goes into great detail yeah. about your experience of awakening and, um, and just your history and yeah. trials and tribulations and what led you to this path yeah. um, called One Blade of Grass. Uh, obviously you can get this on Amazon. I'll put a link to it in the show yeah. notes at kevinrose.com so Thank people you. can find it there. Uh, fantastic book. And then more importantly, well, not, I don't know about more yeah. importantly, but equally as important. You have a new book coming out. That's right. What's the publication date for that? July 9th. July 9th, okay. Yeah. So if you're waiting, and you want your Henry fix, you got the yeah. app and you got yeah. this book yeah. here and you got the Mountain Cloud Zen Center podcast, which I'll link up in show notes. And that's called Original Love. That's right. OriginalLove.org. Oh, sorry. Two things. Yeah. There's the book Original Love, July the 9th from Harper One. Is that pre-ordered now or no? Yeah, you can pre-order it. Great. They've just put it up on Amazon. Okay. And it's got a great cover, by the way. Awesome. And then, and then uh, there's, there's also meditation training, OriginalLove.org, which, which is also, you can check out for Sunday morning sitting. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's, I, I've, I've always kind of wanted to have a proper Sunday morning. As someone that grew up going to church on Sunday morning, 
it's nice to have a spiritual day reset. It is. You know, it is. it's just like, it, it's a yeah. beautiful thing. I know. And I, I, I really feel a loss in that. Yeah. And then not having that after giving up, you know, the organized religion kind of world. So that's partly what we, we made that program for. Which yeah. Just to have a Sunday morning thing. Awesome. Well, Henry, thank you for so much. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure wishing you so much success with these new ventures. And I, I have no doubt they'll be a huge hit because your content is absolutely fantastic. So, uh, you're very kind. Sorry. Kevin, thank you so much. It's been just a real joy to get time with you. Well, let's get you back on the, the show after you launch the book and uh, uh, talk talk again. I'm sure we'll have a whole slew of, of new questions based on the book. So, I'd love that. All right. Thank oh, you. It's so good to be with you.